you need to, go ahead and take a seat. If you want to stay standing, stand. Keep yourself in a posture of worship, no matter what position you put yourself into this morning. In just a few moments, we're going to be talking about Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was more than just a king. He was also a reformer. God used Jehoshaphat to bring reform to the nation of Judah. You'll hear in just a few moments some of those reforms that he did and some of the things that he felt like the Lord was calling him to do to bring the nation of Judah back. At this time, the nation of Israel was divided into ten kingdom, ten tribes that was the nation of Israel and two tribes that were the nation of Judah and Jehoshaphat was called to be the king of the nation of what was considered Judah at that time. We all know the progression of, of, of Judah and Israel's history that depending on the king and depending on leadership and what they would allow to seep in, there was worship of idols, there was, there was worship of self, there was worship of a nation, there was worship of things other than God that was allowed in. And because of that, the presence of God would have to lift because when God's people are involved in things that aren't of him, then his presence has to lift. Do you realize that there's, there's, in, there's things that take our attention? There's places that we allow ourselves to go that the Lord just can't go with us. And his presence will have to lift. And Jehoshaphat was called by God to bring reform. And as the nation repented and as he tore down the worship idols and the worship poles that they had erected to other gods as he tore those things down as he sent messengers into Judah to share the word and to, to open the word again and to teach the word and the nation returned back to the word of God. God's presence, God's presence entered back into the nation of Judah. They hadn't lost God's love in any way, shape, or form. Don't get me wrong. But they lost the presence and the power of an almighty God favoring them above any other nation on earth at that time. And Jehoshaphat comes in and the Lord begins to share in his heart, these are the things that need to go and these are the things that need to come back in in order for my presence to rest on my people again. Dave preached an incredible sermon on fear last week and he talked about being calm. You can see in just a moment that Jehoshaphat in the, in the face of danger, unlike any of us in this room have ever faced, enemies mounting up against him, enemies conspiring against him, enemies coming together and uniting to come against him. He stays calm. And in a moment where all was going good for the nation of Judah, where Jehoshaphat was doing exactly what God had called him to do, bringing reform, and the people were following in a moment that was what I consider a mountaintop experience in, in weeks of struggle that I'm sure Jehoshaphat had in all of this, all of a sudden everything's going great and these nations begin to conspire against him because they, they see the strength, they see the courage, they see the faith of the nation of Judah growing strong and it brought fear. See, when you get stronger in the Lord, when, you, when your faith grows, your enemy fears you. And he will attack you all the more because of that. When he is fearful of you, he will attack you stronger. And that's exactly what was happening to the nation of Judah. As they grew in strength, as they grew in the presence of God, the enemy sees, the enemy saw, and the enemy came against. And in just a moment, you'll see, in just a moment, you're going to see Jehoshaphat's response to all of that. And so this morning, I don't know what situation or circumstances you're in. They say that in a group like this, there's three different situations or circumstances happening. Maybe you're in the midst of a trial or, or a struggle. And you feel like whether it's physical enemies or whether it's emotional enemies or whether it's spiritual enemies, things are just not going well. And life just seems to be a struggle. And maybe you're here this morning and you can resonate with what I just said, but you've, you've struggled through it, you've struggled past it because of the fire that, that came against you. You experienced the fire of God and so you're doing great, but you can resonate with that. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never necessarily struggled. But they say that there's three places that we're in. Those that are 
having trouble, those that have had trouble, and that those that will have trouble. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart in me, for I have overcome the world. One of the promises that Jesus said is that you will struggle. I think one of the things, one of the, one of the biggest farces or biggest fallacies that pastors are preaching in this nation is that you accept God and all will be good with you. You will never struggle again, and I don't believe that. In fact, I believe that sometimes when we step into the things of God, when God calls us into leadership, when God calls us into our giftings, when God begins to utilize us in powerful ways, your life will begin to struggle. You will struggle maybe more than you ever had. I would say that maybe you're not struggling in the room because you're not following God to the degree or the calling that he's called on your life. I'm not saying you aren't either, but what I am saying is we face a tough world. We face a community out there. We face a battle that's not necessarily physical. In Ephesians 6, Paul writes that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spirituality, the rulers, the principalities of this dark world that is all around us, the same dark world that seduced and enticed Adam and Eve. The same dark world that seduced and enticed the nation of Israel and Judah. The same dark world that has seduced and enticed many ministry leaders. We face that on a daily basis. And this morning, I think it would be prudent for us to take a moment to see and to look at how Joshua, how Joshua responded to the enemies that were coming against him. Luke just said a phrase that, was, that I was reminded of a couple of weeks back as I faced a very dark moment, a very thick battle, very close to my house and very close to my heart. And a pastor friend of mine reminded me, Andy, you are a worshiper. You love to worship. And worship is your weapon. Praise is your weapon. Praise is our weapon, church. Worship is our weapon. And if the enemy can get us, I, I think one of the greatest things the enemy has done to the church and our culture as get us, is, is allow us to stand idly by and not enter into the presence of God. He can begin to get us to criticize music style or volume level or song choice or song selection. And by doing so, we miss the exact reason we're here. And that's the presence of God. It's the love of Jesus Christ and entering into the Holy of Holies and into his presence. And I believe as Jehoshaphat was called to reform, I am called to reform Bashor and to call us back into God's presence, to call us out of the criticisms and out of it being about the song and it being more about his presence again. Would you close your eyes with me for a moment? For some of you in this room, I just angered you. For some of you in this room, I just encouraged you. I think it's time to begin to realize that God is God. And this room, this moment is not about us. It's about Him. And here's the incredible benefit to all that. When we get back to it being about Him, it does become about Him blessing us. Father God, I repent. Call us back to you this morning. Israel became, Judah became about everything but you. Don't allow us to be that, Father. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Speak to us this morning. Thank you, worship team. If you would, I just want to quickly enter in to the word this morning. I'm a little nervous. In fact, I'm a lot nervous this morning. I've been nervous since the Lord began to lay this message on my heart a couple weeks back. I shared the message with our staff a few Wednesdays back. And here's why I'm nervous. Because I don't feel worthy to preach the message that the Lord has laid on my heart this morning and only because I believe that the components of it, probably unlike any message I've spoken in a long time, has 
has the potential of changing us. And I'm nervous that I'm not going to get it right. I'm nervous that, that I'm not going to articulate this in the way that the Lord would have me articulate it. I'm nervous. I'm nervous that it won't encourage you and inspire you. I'm nervous that it'll make you angry. I'm nervous that it won't. I'm nervous that it'll set us back. But at the same time, I stand before you this morning knowing that I believe that God has something for us unlike any moment I've seen in a long time in his word this morning. If you're in the room this morning and you've never battled something emotionally, I would say you need to praise God for it. You've never faced an enemy that is your mind. I would praise God for that. But I would also help or ask you to remember that there's people all around you. There's people in your businesses. There's people in your neighborhoods. There's people in this church that the enemy comes against emotionally and mentally. And you can't understand it and you can't comprehend it unless you're going through it. Last week, at the end of the message, I shared about this feeling of loneliness that I deal with and that I battle with. And I've dealt with it most of my life. And I could be in a room this full. I was, with, I was just with some friends at a basketball game in Orlando a few weeks, and in, a few weeks ago. And in the middle of the, the game, in the middle of the moment, 16,000 people, this wave of loneliness comes over me. And it's been there since I was a kid. It's been there since I was a kid, but one of the things that the Lord has helped me do is to understand when that wave comes over me that I have the Holy Spirit in me to push back against that feeling. And I I was encouraged by the phone calls that I got this week of people saying, are you all right? Is there anything that I can do for you? And I got to be, I was able to explain, like, there's no meaning behind the feeling that comes over me. There's no meaning behind that wave. I have a wife that loves me with all of her heart. I have boys that look up to me with all of their respect and love, and I can say that because they're not here to disagree with it. Um, There should be no reason for it, but yet it's there. And some of you resonate with that in the room. I would say that we live in a day and an age and time where fear and anxiety and depression and suicide are rampant. And my question is why? We live in a nation where we have so much. We have warm houses. We have the beach. We live in in one of the most beautiful places in the nation. But yet, this area from Tampa to Naples, from Tampa to Naples, deals with depression and anxiety at a higher rate than most places in the nation. And why is that? I don't understand it. And maybe you're here this morning and you're facing physical enemies. You're facing debt. You're facing financial struggles. You're facing a a health issue. You're facing real, tangible, you can see them, enemies. And this morning, I hope that from the message and from the, the, the chapters that we look at and from Jehoshaphat and the nation of Judah's response to the enemies that were coming against them, that we can gleam from them and that we can push forward. That the enemy, no matter what comes against us, the enemy can't slow us down. The enemy can't discourage us. The enemy can't defeat us. Somebody in the room needs to know this morning, the enemy's coming against you pretty strong, but he cannot defeat you. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is coming against you. And you will see that in just a few moments. Do I seem passionate about this? It's because it's been a struggle for most of my life. For a good part of my life. And the Lord has blessed me with a beautiful wife. The Lord, the, the Lord has blessed me with amazing boys. The Lord has blessed me with a home. The Lord has blessed me to be a part of a church, but yet still the struggle is there. But yet the Lord has also showed me that if I wouldn't have gone or I don't, wouldn't be going through some of the fires that I go through, then the fire of God that's in me wouldn't be there either. And you need to know that this morning. If you're discouraged or depressed, or maybe there's somebody in the room that you're contemplating Ending it all, you need to know this morning that you are a child of God. The most high God, the creator of the universe, has created you in his image. He loves you. He loves you in the midst of those feelings. He loves you in the midst of those emotions. He loves you. He loves you. And so 1 Chronicles 20, we're going to jump right in here, and we've got a lot of reading to do. So I'm going to kind of try to break it up a little bit. 
Chapter 20, starting with verse 1, we're just going to dive in. It says, after this, and know this, that the after this is, is a time of blessing. After this is a time of encouragement. After this, Jehoshaphat had made some mistakes, but God was blessing Judah. So after this, what, what is after this is an extreme amount of blessing from the Lord to the nation of Judah. So after this, the armies of the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Meunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazazan Tamar. This was another name for the En Gedi. So this army had mobilized against Jehoshaphat and against the nation of Judah, and they were coming. They were coming, and I, I like to think that Jehoshaphat was kicked back a little bit, rejoicing in some of the reforms, rejoicing in some of the blessings, and all of a sudden somebody comes running in. And it's like, King, your honor, Jehoshaphat, guess what? There's an army coming against you. There's an army coming against you. They're mobilizing. In fact, they are closer than you can even imagine. Jehoshaphat was terrified. Dave talked on fear last week, and he talked about staying calm talked about celebrating God's goodness. He talked about asking for help. He talked about leaving your concerns with God. And he talked about meditating on the Lord. And that's exactly what Josh, Jehoshaphat needed to do in this moment. And that's exactly what he did. It says Jehoshaphat was terrified by the news. And look at Jehoshaphat's response. He begged. He begged the Lord for guidance. I love Jehoshaphat's leadership, and I'm gleaned so much from him in the past couple of weeks as I've studied this. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all over the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah in Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. I want you to know from my perspective as a pastor, that is not an easy thing to do. It is not easy to stand in front of a group of people and pray Especially if you're about to pray differently and especially if you're speaking a new language that the Lord has placed on you. Especially if you're trying to challenge or encourage that group of people to step into something new. Or you're trying to challenge that group of people to step into a faith or to step into an encouragement. And there are discouraged people or they are people that are distracted or they are empathetic or apathetic to other things other than God and Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah in Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord and he prayed, O Lord God of our ancestors, you alone are God who is in heaven. You are rulers of the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. Listen to this prayer carefully. O our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel alive? He's, he's, he's remembering back to the stories of old. When God showed up when the enemy came against Israel. And, he said, and then he goes on praying and said, And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. Whenever we are faced with any calamity such as war, plague, or famine. Listen to this carefully. Someone needs to underline this in your Bible. Whenever we are faced with any calamity such as war, plague, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. And now see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Sire are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they ran around them and did not destroy them. In a sense, he's kind of blaming God. Here in just a moment, he's being vulnerable and said, remember, you wouldn't let us invade those countries? Well, now look what's going on. Remember when you told us not to go into those countries? Now look at them. The very people you told us not to, not to hurt, the very people you told us not to invade, they are the people coming at us. I can resonate. Now see how they reward us, for they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We don't know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. As all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Yahazael, son of Zechariah, son of, we'll go through those names. I can't pronounce all of them, and you're going to laugh at me if I try. A Levite who was a descendant of Asaph. He said, listen, he said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, even King Jeho 
Hashavat had to take a moment and stop and listen. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Yahruhiel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. That's pinnacle in this whole story, church. Jehoshaphat bowed before the Lord, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same. See, at this moment in time, Judah, Judah hears from this man that hears from the Lord, and he gives them direction. And he gives them, he gives them in a sense, a weird direction. This direction was counterintuitive because Judah was filled with army, with, with warriors that were ready to fight and ready to engage. Even though Jehoshaphat was worried, there were warriors all around him. And this man stands up and says, this is what the Lord is telling us to do. And Jehoshaphat leads them into worship instead of battle. Jehoshaphat leads them into worship instead of battle. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. It's had to be a very exciting moment for the nation of Judah. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all of you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will be able to succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. They sang it over and over and over and over. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground. I know that's very morbid to think about. All they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his men went, to, went out together to plunder. The very enemy that was attacking them, the Lord gave them victory over, and they go and they plunder that enemy. The very enemy who was ready to plunder them, the Lord gives them victory. Now they are plundering that enemy. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days just to collect it all. On the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got its name that the day because the people got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord. It is called the Valley of Blessing today. As I prayed this morning and as I went back over this morning at about 5.15 this morning, as I read that, the Lord gave me a message for somebody in this room. Somebody in this room, after this morning, you have a, 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 a place in your heart. You have a place in your mind. You have a place that the en enemy has come against you for years. And the Lord would say, after today, that moment, that spot, whether it's mental, whether it's emotional, that spot will now become a valley of blessing. The enemy has been tormenting you for years. And after this morning, that, that very place in your heart, that very place in your mind, that very place in your emotion will now be called a valley of blessing. A valley of blessing. Because God will give you victory over it this morning. Then all the men returned to Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat, leading them overjoyed that the Lord had given them victory over their enemies. They marched into Jerusalem with music, with the music of harps, lyres, and trumpets. This had to be extremely loud. Extremely loud. I'm guessing they probably needed some earplugs. And they proceeded to the temple of the Lord. When all the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, the fear of God came over them. So Jehoshaphat, listen to this very carefully. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. Let's pray. 
I'm wondering if we need some peace in our hearts and our minds and our souls this morning. Father God, may we take from a, a historical account of a very incredible moment in the nation of Judah thousands of years ago, may we take and individually apply what you did in Jehoshaphat and the nation of Judah into our hearts, our minds, and our souls this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to real quickly, we go down through this, I want to look at three components that kept Jehoshaphat facing forward. Something the Lord has, has really impressed in my life the past few weeks. First and foremost, first and foremost, if we go back to verse 3, we see that in the midst of fear, in the midst of the terrifying news that Jehoshaphat got, just like Dave preached last week, when fear comes on, what's our reaction? Jehoshaphat stayed calm. And in that calmness, he made the decision that he needed to seek the Lord through prayer and through fasting. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, it says, Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news, but because of that fact that he had seen the Lord at work already, he begged the Lord for guidance, and he also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. Three real quick components. And when the Lord began to lay this on my heart, I'm like, I've already pushed the church for prayer. I've already spoken to the church about prayer. I've already spoken to the church about fasting. This, is, this seems to be a... a, a a reoccurring point that the Lord wants us to get. And the Lord asked me back, well, are they doing it? Are you praying praying and fasting? And the first time he asked it, he asked it about you. He said, are they doing it, Andy? And I got a little bit arrogant. I'm like, I don't see it necessarily corporately, maybe individually. And then the Lord asked me, Andy, are you doing it? He got real, real individual with me. I'm like, yeah, I'm praying. He goes, are you praying dangerous prayers? Are you praying faith-filled prayers? Are you praying for them? Are you praying for your family? Are you fasting? Are you doing it? You've been preaching it, Andy, but are you doing it? And I had to step back and repent. Jehoshaphat sought the Lord through prayer and fasting. Real quick, did a quick little study on fasting and the benefits to us that I think we've lost because we've lost the the art or the component of fasting. First and foremost, when we fast, we deny ourselves something and replace that something with prayer. God brings clarity. These aren't in your notes. You might want to write them down. God brings clarity. There is a clarity that can be found in God that can only be found in fasting. Second, we taste of his goodness. And part of what fasting is about is denying yourself the tastes of the world, in a sense. Denying yourself the taste or the encouragement that we receive from from food or, or, or from other components so that we can then taste of God. See, I wonder if my appetite for the world and my appetite for the Chick fil A's and my appetite. For Applebee's and my appetite for pulled pork and my appetite for Mountain Dew and my appetite for sweet tea and my appetite for all of those things which aren't bad in and of themselves. But if those are the things that I'm tasting, if those are the things that I'm beginning to worship and desire, you remove those things, the Lord can come in and give me a greater taste of who he is. The Bible says, "Taste and come and taste and see that the Lord is good. But sometimes we're feeding, we're feeding ourselves on too much of the world and not enough on God. Fasting gives us moments to just taste on God. Finally, it gives us endurance. It builds up endurance. Ushers in his presence. And so I've prayed about this moment this week because it felt like the Lord calling me to call you into something or to join me in something this week. And the number seven kept coming. So what I'm going to ask you to do is join me this week, and I'm not going to tell you what you should fast. I'm going to encourage you that maybe it should be food. Maybe it should be something that really draws your attention. It should be something that, that, that 
that draws your attention. It's something that consumes an amount of time so that you can replace that with prayer. You can replace that with meditation. You can replace that with reading your Bible. But from starting tomorrow morning till this time next Sunday, I'm calling us as a church, just as Jehoshaphat, just as Jehoshaphat called the nation of Israel or the nation of Judah back to Judah to pray and fast and seek God for guidance and direction on how they were to combat these enemies, I'm calling us into a time of prayer and fasting for the next seven days, into the next seven days, just simply for healing, just simply for direction, for clarity, simply so that we could taste the goodness of God again as a church, so that we would have the endurance that we need to continue to push through the vision and direction that the Lord is calling Bayshore Church to. I'm not going to make you stand. I'm not going to make you any of that. I'm just inviting you in to join me. It can be food. Here's the thing. I'm not inviting you into, like, I'm almost going to speak against the social media fast. I get it. I totally, I did one in January. It was great. But if we're going to taste the goodness of God again, then we need to take away some of the tastes that we are a part of as far as the world is concerned. So, if you're going to accept my invitation, I ask and challenge you to accept it to be something that hurts a little bit, something that is going to take endurance, something that, if it's food, something that as you get hungry, all of a sudden the pains in your stomach remind you, oh, it's time to pray. See, what, pain, what, what, what pains in my stomach do to me remind me that it's time for Chick-fil-A. Reminds me that it's time to feed myself. And most of us, when we start getting those hunger pains, we respond. What happens if when we get those hunger pains, we pray? We pray. Now, somebody in here this morning, you might be saying, Andy, I have prayed, I have fasted, and I'm still not getting an answer. What would you say, Andy, to me who's not getting an answer from the Lord? And the, most, the best, most theological answer I can say to you is, I don't know. I don't know. But I would encourage you to continue to pray and continue to seek. I saw this quote this week. It says, sometimes we don't realize how real God is until we experience the awesomeness of his answerless presence. Let me say that again. Sometimes we don't realize how real God is until we experience the awesomeness of his answerless presence. What if we get to a place where no matter what the answer is, yes or no, it doesn't matter because we know that the presence of God has come with the answer. And it's no longer about the answer. It's no longer about the answer. It's about ourselves entering into the presence of God in a thicker, more tangible way. Think about this. James, the brother of John, Herod arrests James in the book of Acts. And he puts a sword through him. He kills him pretty much immediately. So here's John just watched his brother James get killed by a sword by King Herod. I'm sure that in the meantime there was some prayers and, and John called out to the Lord and, and, and asked for James to be delivered. But he wasn't. He was killed by the sword. Immediately following that, Herod sees how much the people enjoyed James being killed. So he has Peter arrested. Now put yourself in John's shoes. Put yourself in John's shoes. His brother is just arrested and killed by Herod. Now as one of his best buddies, Peter, is arrested by Herod. But here's the crazy thing. God delivers Peter from prison. He opens the doors. The church is there praying. He delivers Peter. Peter gets to walk out. He gets to go to where the group is praying. He knocks on the door. They, excuse me, they couldn't believe it so much that they didn't, even, they didn't even want to believe that Peter was out there. So they finally open the door, and there's Peter. So now put yourself in John's shoes. John prays for his brother James to be delivered. God says, no, James is killed. Peter is arrested. They pray for Peter to get delivered, and God says yes. Could you imagine being John in all of that, crying out to the Lord, like, why didn't you save my brother, but you saved Peter? The most theological answer I have is that we are not God. His ways are higher than our ways. And I would say that ultimate healing comes through death. Think about this. I had to think about somebody I did a funeral for years ago, and, and, and there was hurt and pain and despair around it. And a relative of this person said to me just recently, you know what? They've never hurt again. 
They're in their heavenly body now. They're praising and worshiping at the feet of Jesus. For the past umpteen years, I've never had to worry about them again. That's faith. Ultimately, our healing comes through death when we take off our fleshly bodies and we put on our eternal bodies where there is no hurt, there is no pain. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we don't realize how real God is until we experience the awesomeness of his answerless presence. Second, second, Jehoshaphat recruited his community to surround him. The nation of Judah came together and they prayed. The nation of Judah came together and they engaged. In verses 4 through 6, it says, So people from all towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord, and he prayed, and he prayed. One of the things that I gleaned from the older generation in our group this morning that, that I think we as a younger generation need to take notice of is they have the ability to gather together. They have the ability, they have the ability to stay in community, like physical community. I'm not talking like social media community. I'm not talking about being together and being on your phones. I'm not talking about connecting via Snapchat or via Facebook or via Instagram or via whatever is the most popular app out there. I'm talking about literally physically being together. I love the first Thursday of the month at our, our, at our church offices every month. I love Thursdays through the winter because the ladies are there. The WMSC, are, I always get those initials wrong. Sorry, WMSC, did I get that right, Judy? They are there and they are together and they are loving one another and they are knitting together and they are putting quilts together that go out to Selah, that go out to Gator Wilderness Camp, that go to the Salvation Army, that come here to SCS, that go out to pregnant ladies in our church, that go out to every baby that's made in our church, and they're doing it in community they're doing it in community and so I know good and well that when one of those ladies in that group because I've watched it happen the past two years when one of the ladies in that group is hurting all the other ladies in the group know and they are praying they do cards it's incredible it's one of the most beautiful 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 representations of community that our church has it's not just a gathering together for superficial, for a superficial moment of breaking of bread. It's a gathering together because they love one another, because they don't see each other throughout the year as much. And when they are together, they pray and they do Bible studies, they do devotion. It's incredible. I would dare say my generation and younger, we need to get back to that. And we need to be proactive instead of reactive with it. I was reading... Wasn't sure if I'm going to share this, but I'm going to share it because it was a little disturbing to me. I was, we were working through the office the other day and, and cleaning some things up and, and all of that. And, and I found a, a business report, an annual report that all of the pastors had put together from 2017. And I was reading Dave's report. In 2017, 80% of this church was involved in home churches. That's a pretty incredible number. In fact, I read it again and I said to Dave, 80%, because that is unheard of in the church world. 80%. I would dare say we're under 50 now. Right, Dave? We're under 50% in home churches. And I wonder, what tears at our community? Distraction tears at our community. Schedules tear at our community. It is like pulling teeth to get you all to realize and understand the importance of what a home church is. Of loving each other and being proactive because the moment that something comes up, the moment that, that the enemies are facing somebody, the rest of you can gather around and pray. So I am encouraging, if you are not in a home church, I'm encouraging if you've stopped going to a home church, I'm encouraging you, get with Dave. Let's figure this out. Let's get back to the 80%. I want to see 100%. I want to see 100%. Because when we pray together and when we're engaged together, God moves. God moves. And I don't want to get to that point just so I can tell other pastors that I'm at a higher percentage than them. Although, trust me, I will let them know. I'm doing it because community is special. Community is important. And if the enemy can isolate you, listen very carefully. If the enemy can isolate you, he can hurt you. I've heard it say this way. If the enemy can't get you to sin, he's going to get you to isolate yourself. Then you will sin. 
I know that's harsh. I know that's tough. But community is important. Those of you, I'm calling the Mennonite back out of you. We were good at it a few decades ago. We were good at it a few decades ago. And know that as pastors, we're going to be talking about this. What are, what are some better ways that we can help you all and encourage you to be in community together, to pray together? I got the chance to swing by for just about 15 minutes this week, a, a ministry that we're heavily involved with. Dave and I got to swing by because some of the leaders were in town and they were supporting one another and having some leadership development. I walk into this room in the middle of the day and the community was the very first thing that hit me. The friendships, the walking hand in hand, like it was thick and it was strong. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay. I wanted to partake of it for the rest of the day. Man, don't allow the enemy to isolate you. Finally, finally, and this is the one I've been wanting to get at. It's the title of the message, Raise a Hallelujah. Finally, Jehoshaphat called the nation of Judah to combat the enemy with praise combat the enemy with praise. In 2 Chronicles 20, verses 21 and 22, it says, After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At that very moment, they began to sing and give praise. Excuse me, at the very moment, they began to sing and give praise. The Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. Seems too simple, doesn't it? Seems too simple. Like, wait, you mean that all I need to do is get on my knees before God and begin to declare Him? The word hallelujah literally means God be praised. And when we raise our hallelujah and we declare to the enemy who our God is, as Luke just shared, he's got to listen. Because here's the crazy thing, and I hate this about myself. The enemy that's coming against me, trust me, its belief in God, its faith in God is deeper than mine. So when I declare God, he has to listen. He has to, deli- he has to listen. He has to listen. And so when I raise my hallelujah, declaring that God be praised in the midst of anything, in the midst of anything, the enemy has to flee. The enemy has to go. When I say the name of Jesus Christ, when I say the name of Jesus Christ, the enemy has to go. The enemy has to flee. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean your circumstance or your situation is going to change. What it means is the presence of God comes back in. And infiltrates your mind, your heart, and your attitude. Raise a hallelujah. Some of you in here this morning, you need to get back to declaring who God is over your situations. You need to get back to declaring who God is over your circumstances. Now, how do we do all this? How do we do all this? And I want you to write this in because I don't have this in the notes. I want you to write the words, create margin. Create margin. I read a book a while back. And the book was The Elimination of Hurry. I forget who wrote it. I don't want to say the author anyway, because sometimes you in your mind will eliminate and disqualify. The book was called The Elimination of Hurry. What I mean by creating margin is too much of our time, too much of our schedules, Too much of who we are is filled up. Like we fill the entire page. (laughs) I remember my English teacher at high school, my senior year, came to me and she said, Andy, you're doing really good, but I got to give, you you did a great paper, you wrote a great paper, but I had to give you a C. And I'm like, why? I I worked hard on that. And she's like, Andy, I've noticed what you've been doing. I'm like, what have I been doing? She said, you've been making your margins bigger. I'm like, what? She goes, you've been making your margins bigger. I'm like, huh? She said, I didn't give you word counts the past few projects. I gave you three pages, and I noticed you made your margins bigger. It's like, rats. We need to create bigger margins in our lives so we have time for community. So we have time for prayer and fasting. So we have time. Listen to me. This is great. I love corporate worship. This is one of the most, this is one of the greatest moments of my week. 
like, man, I've learned to worship individually as well, especially in the last couple weeks. I love the gathering of community. That's all about point two, being together here. Don't forsake the assembly. But at the same time, if this is the last time you're going to worship God or, or enter into his presence before next Sunday, you're in trouble. And I don't, think we, I, I don't believe we don't do it because we don't believe in it. I believe we don't do it because we don't have the time to do it. There was a Friday morning for the sake of going a little bit longer here this morning, and I apologize for that. As I was, I had, to, I had to go up to the north end of town by the airport and then come all the way back, and I had about an hour-ish time to do that because of an appointment. And I, as I was in the car and I was running through, I don't very rarely listen to the radio in my car, um, but I was that morning, and they were talking on the Joy FM about this whole hurry they're reading a book. I never got the book's name. They were talking about eliminating hurry in their life. And one of the things that, that they were stating on the radio that morning, they were talking about attention. And there was a phrase that came out that they said, it says, what we give our attention to ultimately blends into our worship. What we give our attention to ultimately blends into who or what we worship. And if, our, if the enemy can't get us to sin, if the enemy can't get us to fall, the enemy is going to distract us. And I think the enemy's done a good job of distracting his people, God's people, us. And because of that, when he distracts us, we're, feel, we're filled with fear, we're filled with doubt, we're filled with anxiety. But see, here's the thing, when we're not distracted, we're still going to have those attacks. Those things are still going to come against us. No matter how much reform Je Jehoshaphat brought, no matter how much presence of God came back to the nation of Judah, no matter what, the enemy still came against them. But this time, they had clarity. This time, they had faith. And this time, they had obedience. They obeyed. And they raised a hallelujah against their enemies. Worship team, if you would come on back up. I wonder this morning, where do you need to create margin in your life for some of these things to take place? I would encourage you in this moment right now, I've done my part. I've done my part. I've, I've laid out before you the message that the Lord has placed in my heart through the Holy Spirit. And what I'm asking you to do now is take a moment this morning and ask the Holy Spirit how he would have you respond to that. Somebody in this room, you've created a very, very busy life and maybe things are going great and maybe things are going well. But the Lord has absolutely no room. There's absolutely no margin there for prayer. There's no margin for community. There's no margin for raising a hallelujah. And maybe the Lord is saying, it's time to create larger margins. And unlike my English teacher, I'm completely okay with you creating larger margins on your paper. This morning, I wonder, and I'm not saying that, I'm, I'm not a health and wealth and prosperity guy, so I'm not saying that, that by doing this, your situation or your circumstance is ultimately going to completely change. But I am saying that God will enter into that situation. The presence of God, as Luke explained earlier this morning, the presence of God can inhabit that hurt. The presence of God can inhabit that praise. See, there's things about my earlier years in life that still come at me. Never have I actually or, or, or received ultimate healing from some of the hurts and some of the pains and some of the rejection of my teenage years. And ultimately, that's where some of my emotionalism comes from and some of the hurts and some of those pains. But in the midst of them, when I raise a hallelujah against them, the presence of God encourages me to continue because I know that if I allow the loneliness to grow, it's going to supersede it. It's going to, be, it's going to begin to grow and increase itself into anxiety. 
And I know that if I don't allow the presence of God to keep the loneliness at bay, anxiety will begin and ultimately suicide could begin. And so the one thing I have learned is when I go through the fire of loneliness, when I go through the fire of despair, that I have a God that I can raise a hallelujah to and his praises will inhabit those feelings. Sometimes they go away immediately. Sometimes I battle them for weeks on end. But I know that I have a God that I can raise a hallelujah to and I I can declare to those feelings, I I can declare to those emotions, you are not real. And I long for the day, I long for the day when my time here on earth is over and I put on my heavenly body because I'll never feel those feelings again. Because ultimately, if I don't ever experience complete and 100% healing here on earth, I will in eternity. I understand the Paul struggle of I long to go be with my creator, but I also long to be here with you and spend time. That's me. Like I long to be here with you guys because I want as many of you, I want as many of that are outside and I want as many in this community to hear the love of Jesus and go with me. So if you would bow your heads for a moment. So Jehoshaphat took the worship leaders and he called them to the front. We've got some worship leaders in this room that aren't on this stage. Right now, in the presence of your brothers and sisters, I'm calling you to the front right now to raise your hallelujah in front of your brothers and sisters. See, Joshua or Jehoshaphat set the singers up in front of the nation of Israel and they began singing and because of that, the nation of Judah, I'm sorry, the nation of Judah began to sing too. So I know that there's worship leaders. There's those of you in the, in the room. The front row is completely open. I want you to get up and I want you to come to the front row because you're gonna raise your hallelujah in front of your brothers and sisters right now. Even if there's only three or four or five of you right now, I don't care what generation you are a part of. You know who you are. You know who you are. You've got a heart for worship and you know how to raise your hallelujah. I need you to come forward right now and I need you to jump up onto the front row in front of the rest of the church the same way that Jehoshaphat set the singers and praise and worshipers in front of the nation of Israel. I would ask... This is a very lonely feeling for them. And it doesn't mean, I don't want anybody to feel condemnation in this room. That's not what this is for. Some of you in the room, you've been given a heart of evangelism. Some of you have been given the gift of prophecy. Some of you have been given the gift of tongues. Some of you, some of us have been given the gift of worship. That's all this is. It's not me. It's not saying to you all that you don't have this heart. It's saying that some people have been gifted to lead people into the presence of God. And that's who I'm calling up here right now. So a second time around, if that's you, come. If that's you, come. I wonder what would have happened to Jehoshaphat if his singers and his praise and worshipers wouldn't have come. He wouldn't have said, no, that's just weird. That, we're used to picking up swords. You, what do you think the warriors said? I think the warriors were like, wait a minute, I'm the one that stands on the front lines, not these guys. Would the rest of us join them and stand this morning? So I wonder if together, church, what happens if we literally raise a hallelujah in this room? What if it, 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 we eliminate the annoyance of it becoming about the song. We eliminate the annoyance of it becoming about the volume level. We, we eliminate the annoyance of it not being the right song selection for us. And we just simply engage and worship God this morning. What happens in the heavenly realms when we do that, church? So I encourage you this morning, let's raise a hallelujah. Some of you in here, you're going to raise a hallelujah for brothers and sisters, for friends, for family, for co-workers that you know the enemy is coming against. We're going to raise a hallelujah in the presence of our enemies this morning.
Let's do that together in community.